announcing Samir Gandesh's talk, uh, Populism Between Reason and Affect. And as you, many of you know, or most of you know, Samir Gandesha is an associate professor here at Simon Fraser University and is the director of the Institute for the Humanities. He has many publications in numerous journals, and I recommend that you look up him on the humanities website if you want to know more about them. Okay, please. Okay, <laughs> Thanks, Willow, for your brevity. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, Thank you all for coming. Um, so you've, you've heard uh, some terrific papers uh, already today. Um, you've heard um, more recently from Willow about um, ethics uh, and the, the location of Kant in the dialectic of enlightenment through um, the Saad and, and with, uh, with Lacan, as it were. And um, now you've had a, a kind of uh, uh, metaphysical uh, talk. What I propose to do uh, is really talk uh, about Adorno and, and politics and, and see um, uh, what we can get out of him in terms of understanding certain contemporary developments. Um, so if contemporary social philosophy is measured by its capacity to come to grips with what is perhaps the most important political development of the previous decade and a half, namely the dramatic rise and consolidation of authoritarian populism and the very real threat that it poses to liberal democratic institutions, then there can be little doubt that it comes up um, short. On the one hand, largely taking their inspiration from a certain reading of Hegel, members of the second and third generation of the Frankfurt School, on the basis of a certain kind of, um, we call it rationalistic, um, and Eurocentric understanding of historical progress, claim that the post-national constel constellation of liberal democratic institutions possesses a power sufficient to address social pathologies, such as what Habermas calls the colonization of the life world, or the harms that accrue from forms of non-recognition or misrecognition um, in the work of Axel Honneth. On the other hand, affect theories deeply influenced by Spinoza, emphasizing desiring production in Deleuze and Guattari, the capacity of the multitude to forge an exodus from empire, um, Hart and Negri, or the possibility of new forms of collective desire to counter the prevailing tendencies of subjects, uh, so the prevailing tendency of subjects to willingly subordinate themselves to capital, I'm thinking of Lordon, suggest radical pathways beyond the impasses of liberal democracy. Both rationalist and affect theories fail to account for the possible uh, emergence, or let's say re-emergence and power of populist imaginaries. The one approach that seeks to provide an understanding of populist reason and its effective force um, is the work of Leclau and Mouffe. In this respect, Leclau's reading of Freud's group psychology and the analysis of the ego is especially important. However, as I've pointed out elsewhere, Leclau's engagement with Freudian social psychology must be regarded as a missed opportunity since he ignores the problem that occupies such an important role in that Freudian text, namely the phenomenon of the regression of the group to a kind of primal horde mediated by a strong leader. As John Kranieuskas uh, argues, and I quote, in Leclau's populist version, the former is no longer the authoritarian father, but just another brother, one among equals, and as a model for thinking the hegemony of one equivalential chain um, or equivalential claim amongst others. It is a means through which populist political identity is produced." End quote. The possibility of regression marks a key feature of psychoanalysis that Leclau struggles with, I think, in his account of populism, namely the manner in which the past weighs like a nightmare on the, on the brains of the living, as Marx puts it in the Brumaire. And the closely related problem for both Freud and Lacan of the compulsion to repeat. Surely, to understand populism today, particularly in its authoritarian form, it is necessary to come to terms precisely with such phenomena. In other words, uh, from both an ontogenetic, ontogenic um, and a phylogenic perspective, psychoanalysis understood not, me not merely as a formal model that can elucidate the equivalent, what Leclerc calls the equivalential articulation of differences, but 
more substantively in terms of a method um, for working through the stubborn persistence of the effects of past traumas, which is, I think, profoundly at odds with Leclau's seemingly voluntarist emphasis on what he calls the radical contingency of the social. While Leclau is deeply indebted to a particular post-structuralist interpretation of Freud, he fails to take seriously the challenge that Freud poses to his discursive account of the social. For Leclau, society as an ontologically coherent space is simply an impossibility. Rather, society is itself a function of uh, articulation. In other words, Leclau's anti-reductionism is taken to its logical conclusion, which is to say of denying the very possibility of certain minimal conditions shared by all societies, such as the necessity of the labor of material production and social reproduction. Yet the recognition of the necessity of work constitutes the very basis for Freud's late understanding of the dynamics of civilization um, and uh, what Marcuse calls repressive desublimation and the nature of resentment um, and hostility that they generate. This hampers Leclau's ability to grasp the full force of Freud's contribution to social psychology, which is profoundly economic um, both in the sense of the necessity of social labor as a basis for civilization and in the sense of the economics of libido, which is to say the dynamics of cathexis. In Civilization and its Discontents, Freud makes clear the manner in which the narcissism of minor differences of ethnic or national identity forms the basis for compensation for the demands of civilization. Such national identity finds expression in the figure of an authoritarian leader who is the object um, of love and the very basis of the social bond. By precluding such an understanding of Freud, Leclau is unable to come to terms with the way in which contemporary right populism capitalizes on deeply authoritarian tendencies within neoliberal capitalism. In this paper, I suggest, however, that while Leclau's contribution um, is a valuable one, his engagement with Freud is a missed opportunity insofar as Leclau remains blind to the way in which Freud highlights the problem of the effective self-subordination of the individual to the group mediated by the popular uh, leader as a response um, to um, a particular crisis in liberal democratic subjectivity. I suggest an alternative account via Theodore Adorno that can help us to better come to grips with contemporary authoritarian populism. There can be little doubt today that after a long period of dormancy, um, authoritarian and at times downright fascistic elements have returned to public life with a vengeance, not just throughout Europe, the UK and the US, but globally, most notably in, in Turkey, India and Brazil. The most visually shocking image uh, of such a return are the migrant detention centers that litter southern Europe and more not notoriously those of neglected, terrified Central American children, allegedly subject to psychical and sexual abuse housed in concentration camps on the US's southern border with Mexico. However, today's fascism, for the most part, does not take the form of a mass movement geared to the violent overthrow of democracy, the installation of a one-party state, and the incarceration and liquidation of its enemies. Rather, it entails the gradual but steady erosion um, of the institutions of the liberal democratic order, consisting of inter alia, the rule of law, the separation of powers, um, the independence of the judicial branch of government, the, the freedom of the press, and the right to dissent. Taken together, such an erosion amounts to what has been called by both defenders and critics alike, illiberal democracy, something that uh, Viktor Orban uh, talks about quite a bit. Against the background, a backdrop of social and economic crises, such illiberal democracy is um, justified by supposedly strong leaders purporting to embody the will of an ethno-national community, allegedly besieged by floods of migrants from below and a nefarious abstract logic of finance from above. Occasionally, as in the case of figures such as George Soros, these two forces are sounded in a paranoid key as locked together in secret complicity. The return of fascistic elements to politics today within the context of neoliberal capitalism, a social order in which the state has become fully marketized, in which the figure of what um, Wendy Brown calls homo politicus has been eclipsed by homo economicus requires some uh, explanation. Uh, 
As Michel Foucault has shown in his lectures on biopolitics in the, in the late 1970s, one of the dominant currents of economic thinking in the newly formed Bundesrepublik um, was the ordo-liberal uh, economic doctrine of the Freiburg School. The doctrine held that the most effective way of preventing the return of the authoritarian state was by giving the rationality embodied in the market full reign, thus enabling it in a kind of Keynesianism in reverse to limit and regulate the state. So how could it be that rather than forestalling authoritarianism, neoliberalism has in fact created a, um, a most propitious environment for it to take root and, and flourish? One way of explaining the relationship between authoritarianism and neoliberalism is through a reading of Theodore uh, Theodore Adorno's essay, Freudian Theory and the Pattern of Fascist Propaganda, hereafter Freudian Theory. While there is now a veritable uh, academic cottage industry in studies on Trump and political authoritarianism, such studies have largely failed, in my view, to connect up their analyses with a larger problem um, of the specifically damaged life of neoliberal society. The reason for this is that they focus rather too much on Trump and figures like him, while overlooking the socioeconomic conditions that make such figures so attractive to a significant um, proportion of the electorate. This is precisely why Adorno's synthesis of socioeconomic and social psychological perspectives um, is so apposite and, and timely. Um, we were just talking earlier about how his lecture, recently published lecture uh, by Surkamp um, on the, the radical right um, uh, delivered in, in, I think, 1957, it, it is, is so timely, it, it seems as if it was only written uh, a, a week ago. Um, so there's a real sort of timeliness about uh, Adorno's contributions. In Freudian theory, Adorno principally engages with two texts. The first is Leventhal and Gutmann's Prophets of Deceit, a study of the techniques of the American agitator, uh, published in 1949. And the second is uh, Freud's Group Psychology and Analysis of the Ego, published one year before Mussolini's Partito Nazionale Fascista's um, March on Rome and the Seizure of Power in 1922. The first represents a content analysis of the speeches of agitators um, or far-right demagogues such as Father Coughlin, uh, Gerald Smith, uh, and Gerald Smith, whom Lowenthal and Gutterman situate in relationship to a typology of responses to psycho socioeconomic problems. Um, the second, Freud's text, uh, seeks to show how the individual's orientation to the reality principle can be short-circuited via a sense of power and security that is afforded by virtue uh, of membership in a mass, again, mediated by a leader. How is it, as Adorno glosses Freud, that modern men and women revert to patterns of behavior which flagrantly contradict their own rational level in the present level of enlightened technological civilization, end quote. In order for such reversion or regression to be fostered, an artificial social bond must be created based upon the pleasure principle, which is to say actual or vicarious gratifications individuals obtain from surrendering to a mass. Freud helps to explain what most other forms of social psychology merely describe the potentiality for short-circuiting the relation between violent emotions and violent actions. The particular nature of the social bond, in Freud's view, enables the individual to throw off um, the repression of his unconscious instincts. Insofar as Freud points to the interpenetration of the archaic and the modern, the mythical and the enlightened elements of social psychology, something that Vladimir was really insistent upon, the interpenetration of these two things, he anticipates the argument uh, of dialectic of enlightenment. Archaic myth and modern enlightenment converge in the idea of sacrifice. The key difference is that the process of enlightenment through disenchantment and rationalization entails increasing introjection or internalization of sacrifice understood as self-renunciation. This is something that was central to, um, to your talk, Lilo, and it's the reading of, of, of Nietzsche. This means that in order, in order to survive, the individual must adjust to external imperatives and as a result renounce the aspiration to um, sensuous fulfillment and happiness. Returning to the question of the nature of the social bond, it seems doubtful, however, that an account of such a bond uh, grounded in libido could provide a convincing account um, of Nazism or fascism insofar as Hitler replaces the loving, 
with the threatening and punishing father. While there is a connection here to Freud's conception of the primal father in Totem and Taboo, it is necessary to explain, according to Adorno, the nature and content of fascist propaganda, which deliberately aims to reactivate the individual's archaic inheritance. Um, that is, it is manufactured and constantly reinforced. If under modern conditions in which the guiding principle of public life is individualism, how is it that individuals can be induced to relinquish their own individuality and, their, and therewith their rational interests, including in extreme cases their very interest in self-preservation itself? This is a question that becomes especially pertinent uh, under the hyper-individualistic conditions of our present neoliberal order. Or to reiterate Adorno's question, how do people become a mass? The answer that Adorno provides via Freud is that this happens through the mechanism of identification. Drawing on Eric H. Erickson's work, Adorno suggests that the agitator appears to be the enlargement of the subject's own personality, rather than simply the image of the father, whose authority had already started significantly to diminish in the interwar period, this idea of the society without fathers that had uh, entered the discussion, especially in the, um, in the post-war period in the 1950s and 60s. Contemporary fascist leaders, then, are not simply the manifestations of an ambivalent image uh, of the father, nor the domineering head of the primal horde, who, the threat, who through the threat of violence establishes a monopoly on women, but rather are what Adorno calls great little men. The process of identification is inextricable for Adorno from that of idealization. In Prophets of Deceit, the authors emphasize the way in which the agitator exploits the negative affects of his followers. Lewenthal and Gutermann argue that, unlike the usual advocate of social change, the agitator, while exploiting a state of discontent, does not try to define the nature of that discontent by means of rational concepts. Rather, does he increase his audience's disorientation by destroying all rational guide points and by proposing that they instead adopt seemingly spontaneous modes of behavior? Quote, there's a long, long quote there. Adorno explains more specifically how these frustrations and anxieties emerge in the first place and how fascist propaganda exploits them by promoting, again, this process of identification through idealization. Now, this is the crux of Adorno's argument. He suggests that frustration has to do with the characteristic modern conflict between a strongly developed, rational, self-preserving ego agency and the continuous failure to satisfy their own ego demands." End quote. In other words, the conflicts stem from the contradiction lying at the heart of liberal democratic society. Between the political ideal of individual autonomy or self-determination through democratic institutions on the one hand and a purely negative conception of freedom that characterizes um, the market uh, on the other. As Adorno presciently states in Negative Dialectics, and I think this is such a, a key uh, passage um, that really deserves attention. The more freedom the subject and the, and the community of subjects ascribes to itself, the greater its responsibility. And before this responsibility, it must fail in a bourgeois life, which in practice has never yet endowed a subject with the unabridged autonomy accorded to it in theory. Hence, the subject must feel guilty. For Adorno, this is really the crux, right? The affordance. Um, uh, on the one hand, of a certain kind of responsibility, but then the lack of, um, uh, in a sense, resources to actually discharge that responsibility. As a result of this contradiction between the idea ideality and the actuality of freedom, the promise of and failure to realize a self-determined life, the individual experiences frustration and discontent um, uh, in the face of um, her failure to realize um, her own or live up to her own ego ideal. Such a conflict constitutes a key aspect of the damaged life of 
uh, late capitalist societies, of which I think Sherry's going to talk later. The anatomy of which Adorno lays bare in Minima Moralia. This conflict, Adorno argues, results in strong narcissistic impulses which can be absorbed and satisfied only through idealization as a partial transfer of the narcissistic libido to the object. The collective adulation and love of the leader is the way in which the frustrated modern subject overcomes its negative self-image resulting from the failure, again, as I said, to approximate this ego ideal. The gap between the ego and ego ideal becomes, in other words, unbearable. The leader's seductive aura of omnipotence, therefore, owes less to some uh, archaic uh, inherit, uh, inheritance um, of the primal father uh, and much more to the individual's uh, own narcissistic investment in collectivity uh, resulting from this failure. So it's that failure that drives the individual's identification with both the leader and the, the collectivity that he, in a sense, uh, personifies or embodies. In order for such collective identification through idealization to be successful, the leader must be absolutely narcissistic. That is someone who is loved but does not love in turn. This is what explains the agitator's disinterest in contrast to the revolutionary and reformer alike um, in presenting a positive political program outlining concrete policy proposals, as Leventhal and Guterman point out. Right, so the, um, the agitator, on the one hand, has no interest in presenting anything concrete uh, as a way of addressing the, the discontents um, uh, uh, amongst the, uh, their followers. Um, whereas the reformer and revolutionary at least offer some kinds of uh, um, uh, uh, proposals. In place of such proposals, um, which would suggest some minimal concern for the needs of the followers, there is only the paradoxical program of threat and denial. At the same time, the leader embodies a contradiction between, on the one hand, appearing to be a superhuman fi figure, and on the other, an average person, as Adorno puts it memorably in reference to Adolf Hitler, a comp composite of King Kong and the suburban barber. This is key to understanding the seductive psychological structure of fascism. These two dimensions mirror a split in the follower's narcissistic ego, one part of which, of course, attaches to King Kong and the other to the suburban barber. It is thus that the leader represents the followers as the followers' own enlargement. Fascist propaganda is structured around the basic concept of the great little man, as I already suggested, a person who um, uh, manifests both omnipotence and the idea that he is just one of the folks, a plain, red-blooded American, untainted. It is in this way that Adorno provides an account of the guiding concept of the authoritarian personality, which was published one year before the publication of Freudian theory. That personality type characterized both by subordination to the strong, right, so the suburban barber, and domination over the weak, King Kong. In this, the structure of social character reproduces a contradiction lying at the heart of bourgeois society between a theory or principle of autonomy freedom, and the practice of heteronomy, literally being determined by another, um, or unfreedom. The image of the great little man, therefore, according to Adorno, addresses, and I quote, the followers twofold wish to submit to authority and to be the authority himself. This fits into a world in which irrational control is exercised, though it has lost its inner conviction, inner conviction through universal enlightenment. The people who obey the dictators also sense that they are superfluous. They reconcile this contradiction through the assumption that they themselves are the ruthless oppressor." End quote. This perfectly um, expresses, or this is perfectly expressed in Hitler's slogan, which lays bare the essence of, of the um, ambivalence of the authoritarian or uh, sadomasochistic personality type. Verantwortung nach oben, Autorität nach unten. Responsibility towards above, authority towards below. Whereas Adorno writes in chapter 19, 
of the authoritarian personality. The identification of the authoritarian character with strength is concomitant with rejection of everything that is down. The more superfluous the idea of the dictator within formally democratic and egalitarian, though substantively unequal societies based on private ownership and control of the means of production, the more emphasis that would be placed on precisely the, the dictator's ersatz quality, kind of fakeness. Such phoniness is maintained in the form of the hollow uh, shell of the artificial group of the religious institution. The hierarchy of religion, stripped of its spiritual essence, is taken over by fascism, in particular in its emphasis on the distinction between sheep and goat, insiders and outsiders, and also therefore on its deployment of negative libido. We feel our bond precisely by the fact that we hate the other. In other words, the emphasis on love within the Christian religion, which was nonetheless also based upon um, a uh, contempt, hatred towards those who remained outside of the faith, the infidel, is now divested of even the appearance of fellowship or agape and transformed into an almost exclusively negative, uh, negatively integrating function. This enables fascism to play its unity trick, which is to say it elides differences within the group other than the extant hierarchy, of course, um, by emphasizing differences between the group and those that remain outside of it. And I think if there's a kind of authoritarian dimension of uh, identity politics, it has to also do with a certain kind of unity trick, that you know, differences within the group are elided, they don't exist, especially differences of class. Right? I think this has to be uh, taken up. Such a trick culminates in what Adorno um, terms uh, a regressive egalitarianism. All members of the national community should equally be denied individual pleasures. The social bond is, as it were, solidified through a shared introjection of sacrifice or the renunciation of the aspiration to a sensuously fulfilled life. The Nazis repeated um, uh, and hyperbolic demands for, for sacrifice for the fatherland uh, which echo every form of nationalism, particularly when it comes to war, bear this out. Adorno touches upon a key technique by which fascist propaganda emphasizes the difference between insider and outsider groups, namely the repeated um, use of images of lower animals, insects and vermin to characterize foreigners, Jews, refugees, oh, Muslims drawing not only on Freud, but also on Otto Rank's observations that in dream symbolism, insects and vermin signify younger siblings, babies, and such symbolism scarcely conceals uh, negative cathexis. Yet at the same time, such brothers and sisters have identified with one another through a shared love object, namely the leader. And therefore, this, this uh, uh, negativity must be directed or projected uh, outward beyond the group. So this is a way of accounting for you know, the, the, the images of lower uh, animals, insects and vermin and so on. Here one might argue, however, as Horkheimer and Adorno suggest in Dialectic of Enlightenment, that it's not just the displacement of contempt experienced by the followers themselves that is projected outward in the image of uh, lower animals, but also um, a direct evocation and propaganda of powerfully, effectively charged tropes of abjection. As you, uh, Julia Kosteva suggests, it has ultimately to do with the pre relation to the maternal body, and in turn with the transgression of a boundary um, and the ensuing production of disgust. And I'm gonna quote, but anything natural which has not been absorbed into utility by passing through the cleansing channels of conceptual order the screech of the stylus on, on slate, which sets the teeth on edge, the ho gu, which um, brings to mind filth and corruption, the sweat which appears on the brow of the diligent. Whatever is not quite assimilated or infringes the commands in which the progress of centuries has been sedimented is felt as intrusive and arouses a compulsive aversion. The abject and, compul and the compulsive aversion it evokes have to do with a compulsive fear of self-dissolution. This constitutes a drive to eliminate the, the non-identical or that which cannot be conceptually grasped without remainder. 
in the attempt to bring nature under, under the full sway of technolog technological control and mastery, whatever residue of uncontrolled, uncontrollable, non-identical nature remains elicits uh, a reaction, a response of revulsion and aversion. The very signs of destructiveness that fascism substantially embodies, in other words, are projected outwards onto its victims. Fascism, in this sense, is the paranoid performance of the victimizer who compulsively assumes the role of victim. Abjection is employed as a propagandistic technique, in other words, to portray the other as a dangerous contagion who threatens the health and the very life of the body politic and must therefore be spiritually and physically excluded um, by force and violence if necessary. Traces of offensive yet secretly desired nature projected onto the stranger, which as a result become his stigma. Once so projected, the other can then be contain, con contained, excluded, and in extreme cases ultimately liquidated or exterminated, like pests and vermin. Through the process of extir extirpating the non-identical, the identity of the ethno-national community is confirmed and stabilized. So address Adorno addresses the question of how um, agitators come to such precise knowledge of group psychology without really having the intellectual wherewithal to access it? The answer is that given the psychological um, uh, identity between the leader and led, the agitator accesses mass psychology by virtue of his own psychology. The key difference, though, is that the former evinces a capacity to express without inhibitions what is latent in them rather than by any natural superiority. The authoritarian leader is an oral personality type uh, who, according to Freud, seeks gratification through eating, drinking, and other oral activities, including speaking. The aggressive oral type is hostile and verbally abusive towards others. The agitator evinces a capacity to speak incessantly and to befool the other. This incessant nature of, uh, of such speech leads it um, to void itself of sense and to become magical. It casts a spell over its listeners and plays on the followers' archaic inheritance. The power he exercises, paradoxically indicative of his powerlessness insofar as it intimates ego weakness rather than strength, laying bare his unconscious drives. Yet at the same time, this plays into the very image of the leader as the enlargement of the follower's own ego. In order successfully to meet the unconscious dispositions of his audience, Adorno argues, the agitator, so to speak, simply turns his unconscious outward. The fit between the agitator's techniques and the psychological basis of their aim is assisted by the larger transformations in society that contribute to the increasing passivity uh, of the individual, which is to say the decline of her capacity for experience through the consolidation of the culture industry as a whole. The standardization that lies at the heart of the culture industry harmonizes perfectly with a key attribute of the authoritarian personality, namely stereotypy and their infinite sorry, their infantile wish for endless, unaltered repetition. The, the link between European high culture and the culture industry for Adorno can be located in the easily recallable leitmotif uh, originated by Richard Wagner, which he likens to the component parts of factory assembled products, a kind of musical Fordism. In order to mobilize the masses against their own interests, fascist propaganda, tends to circumvent discursive thinking and to mobilize irrational, unconscious, regressive forces. In this, it is aided greatly, as I've suggested, by the culture industry um, that it already diminished the human capacity for autonomy and spontaneity. So what are we to make of Adorno's social psychological account um, of <clears throat> fascist propaganda today? Well, the three broad areas in which Adorno's reflections are, I think, illuminating um, the area of populism, analysis of contemporary agitators, and finally, um, the culture industry. Before addressing these in, in turn, however, it is important to consider the uh, limitations of Adorno's reflections as well. Uh, as I have argued elsewhere, the sociological assumptions of Adorno's appropriation uh, of Freud, specifically Friedrich Pollock's conception of state capitalism, according to which the state's role is to manage the crisis tendencies of capitalism, must be rethought in a period characterized by the obsolescence of Keynesianism. Um, moreover, Adorno's unmediated reliance on 
uh, orthodox Freudian categories um, and the, the concept of uh, Oedipal com conflict requires some rethinking and, and, and reconstruction insofar as Freud's atomistic Habesian ontology does not sit particularly well with a social ontology that's indebted to Hegel and Marx. And I think Lacan is interesting precisely because it gives you a different uh, basis, right? A different kind of ontology grounded in, uh, in Hegel above all. Ah, well, that's my job. Um, what remains of enduring importance, however, is Adorno's discussion of the basic contradiction lying at the heart of capitalist democracy and the way in which authoritarianism today reemerges as a powerful, if false, response to it in the face of a paucity of uh, viable alternatives, which comprises uh, what Marcuse uh, once called one-dimensionality, one-dimensional society. The objective condition for the stub stubborn persistence of authoritarianism is a contradiction lying at the heart of a liberal democratic society. And I alluded to this already, but I think it, it bears repeating. Um, between the democratic principle of egalitarianism on the one hand and the liberal conception of freedom on the other, the neoliberal financialized form of capitalism, which has been in place roughly since the mid-1970s, is dramatically sharp in this contradiction insofar as the citoyen or Brown's homo Politicus has, has become eclipsed by Homo economicus, understood now as the entrepreneur of himself. The latter is for, uh, forced to take more responsibility for himself, yet at the same time has access to fewer and fewer resources with which to actualize this responsibility in any meaningful sense. On average, rates of growth in high-income countries have dropped precipitously since um, the 1960s, in which growth was something like 4.3 per annum, following to, to uh, 2.8 uh, the, the, the following decade, 2.3 in the 1980s, 1.8 the decade after that, and 1.2 in the 2000s. Accordingly, since the 1970s, wages for the vast majority have remained stagnant, not even keeping pace with inflation. While welf welfare state provisions, as we know, have declined considerably, and social services as well as higher education have become infinitely more costly. What has filled this vacuum is growing financialization and, of course, debt, a very important topic in the genealogy. Debt is ever-present. Um, individuals constantly fall short of their ego ideals, as a result of which there's a corresponding proliferation of guilt, anxiety, frustration, and ultimately anger. Ironically, rather than forestalling authoritarian tendencies as, German, uh, as West German ordo-liberalism maintained that it would, the advent of neoliberalism has proven to be particularly fertile ground for the germination of neo- and, and, and post-fascist political movements in a way that echoes Moish Postone's analysis of the implicit anti-Semitism um, at the heart of one-sided criticisms of finance capital, understood in terms of abstract labor from the standpoint of um, the working class or concrete labor. Um, Phil Neal argues that, and I quote, as one of the poorest generations in recent history, debt and rent are the defining features of our lives. It is, in fa it is this fact that makes the current incarnation of the far right an actual threat because it increases the probability that some variant of present day patriot politics might actually find a mass base. As a program formulated specifically to oppose the extraction of rents from an unwilling population in the far hinterland is translated into a more general opposition of rents as the primary form of exploitation in contemporary capitalism, right? So um, a false critique of capitalism. So the contradiction between autonomy and the political realm, um, in the political realm are the formal structures of representative democracy and the increasing heteronomy within the economic realm becomes ever more uh, unbearable. As Adorno states in the meaning of uh, working through the past, Fascism essentially cannot be derived from subjective dispositions. The economic order, and to a great extent, also the economic organization modeled uh, upon it, now, has, now as then renders the majority of people dependent upon conditions beyond their control, and thus maintains them in a state of political immaturity. He goes on to argue, if they want to live, then no other avenue remains but to adapt submit themselves to the given conditions. They must negate precisely that autonomous subjectivity to which the idea of democracy appeals. They can then, they can preserve themselves 
only if they renounce their self. The necessity of such adaptation, of identification with the given, the status quo, with power as such, creates the potential for totalitarianism. So the potential for totalitarianism resides not from outside of democracy, outside of capitalism, but from its very, um, its very structures. This is why I'm quite concerned to maintain uh, strong emphasis on universalism. The idealization and identification with the aggressor can be regarded as a false solution to this contradiction. In The Great Little Man, the follower is mesmerized by an enlarged image of himself before which he bows down. Adorno's account of the mechanism of identification through idealization is especially helpful in understanding a host of uh, right populist leaders who appear to embody this oxymoronic uh, idea of the great little man. Uh, I think of uh, the Filipino president, uh, Rodrigo Duarte, um, uh, Narendra Modi, um, Jair Bolsonaro, um, Boris Johnson. However, no one embodies this oxymoron more clearly than the current president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, who exemplifies the great little man and is, is consequently regarded by his supporters as a larger than life version of themselves. But could it be said that their followers, followers of Trump and others, have internalized the logic of self-sacrifice or renunciation? Isn't it the case that they are aggressively standing up to the elites that have sacrificed them on the altar of globalization. Now, Trump may not explicitly demand self-sacrifice, but in supporting him, most of his, his supporters nevertheless sacrifice their own interests. For example, in the continued viability of the Affordable Care Act. Um, the massive tax cut for the ultra-rich will and has already started to materially harm them. To this one could add the opioid crisis, which is in intrinsically related to it, that keeps deepening among poor uh, whites, and as a result, dropping their life expectancy quite rapidly. Trump's supporters could be called self-sacrificing in, in a very literal way then. Therefore, when the political establishment attacks him for his somewhat tenuous grasp of the English language, sartorial faux pas, gustatory blunders, fake hair, too long tie, etc. it backfires and only reinforces the idea of the establishment's contempt, not only for the president, but the demos, the people who idealize and identify with him. It reinforces their identification with the aggressor. So despite being presented with evidence that his presidency has harmed them materially, their support remains more or less unabated. Yet at the same time, Trump's supporters' love for his president is matched only by the hatred and occasional violence that they direct towards the other. Verantwortung nacht oben, Authorität nach unten. Trump is clearly an aggressive world type who expresses his unconscious through his incessant tweets, often issuing threats to his political rivals, such as Hillary Clinton. Or perhaps more disturbingly, encouraging his followers at a, uh, at a recent rally to direct the chant to send her back at the Somali-American representative from Minnesota, Ilan Omar. But this also leads Trump against himself, and I think to the horror of the US establishment, to occasionally revealing the naked truth of US foreign policy, that it is based on a scarcely disguised strategy of pillaging resources um, such as Syrian oil. The incessantly con contradictory nature of Trump's speech eviscerates language as a genuine medium of truth claims. His violence enacted on language itself is key to understanding our increasingly post-truth post era, perhaps even more than the rise of far-right media outlets such as Breitbart News. The slogan, Make America Great Again, moreover, draws upon the rhetoric of an authentic, falsely concrete American life, liberated from the frighteningly abstract inscrutable global processes signified by the barely concealed uh, anti-Semitic trope of the swamp. The fetishization of the wall on the US's southern border with Mexico represents an extreme expression of, author of authoritarian populism globally. Uh, it's kind of metonymy, manifesting a heightened hysteria directed at those driven to migrate by geopolitical and economic catastrophes. Despite his claim that climate change is a hoax or a conspiracy, Trump seems very well to be preparing for a worsening crisis of the climate and ensuing uh, um, uh, deepening of a uh, crisis of migrancy. So people are transformed into a mass by virtue of a common object of affection, 
that is inextricable from the negative libido generated by way of the projection of strangeness, which is to say illness, contagion, and danger, the abject, onto the outsider. Such negative li libido is bolstered by references to shithole countries and statements like all Haitians have AIDS. Moreover, in addition to demonizing refugees as an invasion, telling four non-white uh, members of Congress to go back to the broken and crime-infested place from which they came, quite erroneously, actually, Trump refers to Baltimore, the home of the late uh, re um, Representative Elijah Cummings, as a disgusting rat and rodent infested mess, right? language of abjection. And that was far worse um, and more dangerous than the conditions at the southern border. The French author Jean Respel, who has uh, profoundly influenced Trump's former uh, advisor, Steve Bannon, portrayed um, a Europe in the near future overrun by the dispossessed of the third world, symbolized by defecating and fornicating Indian mig migrants in his racist dystopian novel, um, The Camp of the Saints. One can see in Trump's rhetoric not only overt misogyny, as we know, uh, but also a hatred of ambiguity, which might explain the ferocity of his attacks uh, on the uh, LGBTQ communities and transgendered people in particular. Perhaps most presciently, Adorno with Horkheimer draws attention to the, the elective affinity between the authoritarian personality and the, the culture industry. The condition for the possibility of people being transformed into a mass is the passivity that follows from the gradual uh, but steady weakening of the critical function of the ego. I don't have that much more, so I'm nearly done. In their account of the culture industry, Horkheim and Adorno show the way in which the, um, uh, the former, that's to say the culture industry, replaces what Kant had called tra transcendental schema, according to which the sensible manifold is related to concepts through the activity of the imagination by ready-made thought models, the termini techniki, which provide them um, with a kind of iron logic following the decay of language. The perceiver is no longer present in the process of perception. He or she is incapable of the active passivity of cognition in which categorial elements are appropriately reshaped by preformed conventional schemata and vice versa so that justice is done to the perceived object." Quote. Today we see this in, in the digitization of the culture industry in recent decades. The algorithm has arguably come to replace the transcendental schema in organizing the manifold of sensible intuition. In place of Fordist mass production and standardization, it now generates difference and heterogeneity tailored specifically to the whims and tastes of each individual. Yet the algorithm is a code that also nonetheless locks into place a logic of repetition and stereotypy. Uh, often confirming, deepening, and reinforcing the subject of prejudices mentioned above through the creation of um, echo chambers uh, um, and the like. Just as 20th, 20th century fascists use um, uh, radio and film to spread their propaganda, contemporary agitators evince a predilection for the use of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and so on, which amongst other things enables them to effectively bypass the putatively uh, rational and critical scrutiny of serious journalists, intellectuals, and academics, and communicates often unconscious wishes and desires directly to their followers. While social media has been taken up by progressive forces, um, no doubt, to organize and mobilize against authoritarian regimes, for example, in Iran in 2009, um, which, of course, the Iranian regime today has learned a, a, a lesson from, which is why they've shut the um, the, the, uh, the means of communication down immediately. Um, and also in, in, during the Arab Spring and Occupy movement and so on, it has increasingly become the means by which the far right has successfully uh, manipulated uh, voters as a Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal has shown. Social media has provided the infrastructure for, for right-wing populist parties and movements to spread fake news and misinformation. Could be said to create new types of what Freud called artificial groups that undermine the reality testing capacity and therefore critical capacity of the ego. It is both the medium and expression of a turning outward of the unconscious. Furthermore, online mes mes message boards such as 4chan and 8chan make uh, possible, possible precisely the short-circuiting of the relationship between violent emotions and violent actions. Taking inspiration from the far-right uh, 
mass murderers, uh, Anders Breivik and uh, uh, Brenton Tarrant, that is the Christchurch murderer, copycat white supremacists in Europe and North America, particularly in the United States, have discussed and planned their attacks on these message boards before executing them in the real world. Participants discuss topics such as target selection, most effective ways to maximize body counts, and online uh, groups uh, compare and, and celebrate the number of casualties from shooting to shooting and what the New York Times calls a gamification of mass murder. Attacks are, uh, attackers often post manifestos and the case of the, and of, in the case of Christchurch, in fact, provide a live feed of the attack in, in real time. The aim, of, uh, the aim is to appeal to the unconscious aggressive impulses of others who form part of the virtual artificial group. Now, just to come to a conclusion, Adorno's examination of the stubborn persistence uh, in the post-war period of the authoritarian personality type was oriented towards articulating a new categorical imperative after Auschwitz, um, that the Holocaust would never repeat itself. Key to this for Adorno was the Kantian idea um, uh, uh, understood, the Kantian idea of uh, autonomy understood as Mundischkeit, um, the idea of political maturity, or the notion that the citizen must be empowered to speak for herself as an autonomous subject. This means a capacity to break the compulsion to repeat embodied in the culture industry. The citizen is capable of speaking for himself, according to Dorno, because he has thought for himself, is not merely repeating someone else. He stands free of any guardian. Mundischkeit is vital, moreover, for the citizen's capacity to resist conformity to prevailing opinion and stands in close relation to what Kant called reflective judgment. That's a very important concept for Hannah Arendt. Um, at the same time, Adorno emphasizes with Nietzsche and later Kristeva that we are all strangers to ourselves. This means that aspects of our experience pain, trauma, suffering can never be made fully transparent, can never enter into concepts without some excess or remainder eluding their grasp. In this, as a psychoanalyst Christopher Bolas has suggested, the genuine plurality of democracy must echo the plurality within the mind. Such a pl plurality, however, will not truly come into its own until the opposition between liberalism and democracy uh, has been transcended and overcome. Thank you for your attention. Please.